fabulous. Well, welcome to Unusual Suspects. Um, I hope everyone's had a lovely tasting so far. Some great wines out there. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to do this masterclass with Condor, who I think are real champions of South American wine, and certainly, of course, some of my favourite producers. So it's always a privilege to do this. My name is Amanda Barnes. I'm a wine writer. I've been based in South America since 2009. And I've written a book on South America, um, which we published last year, and a website with lots of information too. So if you are studying more about the wines of South America, uh, please do um, have a look at the website. The, the maps that I'm going to be showing are all downloadable for free online, in case it's useful for you um, when you're presenting your wines as well. We're going to start, we're going to taste through some less common uh, varieties uh, or wines from South America. And I want to kind of give a brief introduction as to the kind of history of, of wines in the, in the whole continent, actually. So our first Vitis vinifera vines arrived with Christopher Columbus's second voyage uh, to the continent. Uh, when he arrived here, it has Hispaniola, which is the Caribbean. Uh, and he was actually the vines came down through South America, through Venezuela was actually where they were first planted on the continent of South America. And then really, please do come on through. You go in the master. Grab a seat. Um, and they were first kind of planted down on the top of the Caribbean coast and then also made their way to Peru. And here is where we see they come through the coast of Chile. Uh, from Buenos Aires and Argentina, they came from the other direction. And um, we also had plantings come through to Mendoza and the north of Argentina from Bolivia and from Chile. Um, so they travel quite far and they travel quite quickly. Um, and so those first varieties to come, the first business vinifera, um, are what we often call criolla varieties. Listan Prieto, which we also know as Pais in Chile. Has everyone tried nice Pais wines? Fabulous. Uh, Moscatel de Alejandria. And from this, a nice family of native varieties came. And this is really where we see the kind of historic uh, winemaking of South America in Bolivia, in Peru, and uh, very much related to these Criollo varieties and these home wines uh, that people were making for themselves and also uh, for the church. Um, and then in the 1850s, that's kind of the modern era of South American wine. And what happened then is we suddenly got this big immigration of intellectuals um, from Bordeaux mainly, who were invited in in order to modernise the wine industry. And with them, they brought lots of international or popular European varieties at the time. Malbec, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, all of these came in this period uh, and spread throughout South America. And this is a really interesting time because we also had huge waves of immigration coming through. So from 1870 to 1960, we had four million Italians arrive to Argentina. That's even big in our concept of populations today, but it really was 100 years ago as well. Um, and two million Spanish. And with them, they were bringing great vines as well. So often they would be bringing vines in their suitcases with their belongings um, to start a new life in the Americas. Um, and it's a similar story uh, in Chile as well at the same time. They have a lot less immigration of Europeans because it's a much harder country to get to, especially in those times you can hop over the Andes and fight, um, and it's a rougher sea to go get there from Europe as well. So really kind of Argentina benefited from that, but Chile also benefited a lot from this more um, intellectual and academic importation of vines. Why is that so interesting in the history of European wine? Because what happened at the end of the 1800s? Phylloxera, which completely decimated many of the vineyards of Europe. And so actually Chile becomes a real treasure trove um, of these old varieties which got lost elsewhere um, because largely Chile was never affected by phylloxera and Argentina was very rarely affected by phylloxera too. So those are our kind of two main eras. Uh, now we're going to start kind of tasting through and we'll dive into some of the age of these different grape varieties uh, for South America. We're going to start our story in Mendoza. Mendoza being our absolute heartland of Argentine wine, home to over two thirds of wine production. And we're going to go to one of the most exciting kind of new GIs, um, in my opinion, 
which is Vostokaius. Is everyone comfortable what a GI is? It's a geographical indication. Uh, and that's kind of the modern appellation system in Argentina. Now, what's really interesting about these new GIs is that historically in South America and most of the world, in fact, um, appellations have been political, political boundaries. Um, whereas these modern GIs are looking at geology, they're looking at climate, and they're looking at precedence or style of the region. So it's not quite the same as our French appellations which control what you're planting, how you're planting, and your production. It's looking at creating an appellation that shows the continuity in terms of microclimate and soil and the character of the wines. So in order to achieve this, they do have to be able to prove how their Malbec tastes different to the region next door. Someone very interesting to talk to about the development of this GI is, is Tybalt. And um, Piedra Negra is just as you walk in. And uh, he's part of the association and he will be able to give you a nice kind of overview of that. But his boss, <laughs> Francois Lerton, was the first to pioneer this region of Los Chicaes uh, in 1996. And today it's grown uh, to 1,000 hectares. Now what's very interesting, I'll try and point out uh, on here in case you can't see, but it kind of starts here, it's this kind of green, green line, it moves all the way up here. And what's fascinating about Los Chicaes is even though we do have um, a unity of kind of expression in some of the wines, there's a lot of diversity within this region. So it spreads uh, just over 15 kilometres but within that, we have over 700 out meters of altitude difference between these lower areas and the higher areas. Um, we've also got lots of different soils because we're at different proximities to the mountain range. Um, so we go from winkler one to winkler two uh, and three in some cases. They're quite significant differences climatically, but much more consistent the lost clients compared to you know comparing it to the other regions. What we're going to see, I think, in the next decade or so is splitting up these GIs even further. Um, but that's still a way to go because we're still describing the difference between Mendoza, Uco, Tunia in this case, and then Ostracaya. So there's still a lot of work to go, but if Burgundy can do it, there's no reason that we can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> just to confuse, just to make it even harder for everyone, but even more fun. Let's just start going down the route, it's actually really good fun. Okay, so our first wine um, that you should have here is uh, the Japot. Does anyone know what Japot stands for? We cheated because we came up with it. Yeah, so if you flip it, it's the opposite of Tokai, uh, which is the variety of Tokai Fruliano that was widely planted uh, in Argentina. Uh, Sauvignon Verde is another name for it. Uh, and actually, Lerodon started bottling it with Tokai on the label and got in a bit of trouble and had to remove it and made a very careful, like fun play on the word um, to change it to Jackal. But here we are um, with this pure Fruiano wine. So let's have a taste. I love this wine, it's nice to start with. Yeah, so those who just come the masterclass of Tibor will be experts on the wines right now. <laughs> um, but what I love about this wine is that I think it really embodies that more textural style of white wines that we're really starting to see in premium Argentine wines. You know, it's got lovely length to the palate for me um, and a really kind of bright acidity. And I think Los Tocais is a region where we get excellent quality white and reds. And very much under the, the banner of Le Don, really, um, we're seeing quite diverse varieties in the region as well. And they were one of the first to do a really top white blend, which is another kind of key uh, trend of movement that we see in Argentina. Uh, I think this is a beautiful wine. What does everyone think of the Tokai? Oh, sorry, Jackpot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, it's lovely. And that's also, I think, it really kind of shows up. Um, moderate use of oak, just kind of bringing a bit of texture, add a bit of kind of, um, you know, ageability to the wine, and then also this kind of use of, kind of concrete and uh, very kind of neutral winemaking techniques. Fabulous. 
Uh, any questions about this before we sweep on to our next unusual variety? Um, I do recommend speaking to Tibble. The other unusual variety that they have, which is very interesting, is their use of cot uh, as another kind of variation on Malbec. It's another interesting one to discuss and discover. Uh, and they were also a great pioneer of Pinot Grigio or Pinot Gris uh, in Argentina. Mm -hmm. And so, do you know, do you know why, like the, the actual history of the the name of the grape? Because I know also it's known as like Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, Sauvignon. Yeah. yeah. But why, why Tokai? Did it just. I don't know why it became named that way. I think it's one of those varieties that has been planted so widely in so many places, and it was largely mistaken in, in Chile as well for Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and so I think it's one of those varieties that's made its way into lots of places and taken on lots of synonyms. Okay. Um, I, I don't know, did Tibot say anything about, did he have any interesting detail into the name? I think he just mentioned that it isn't related to Tucker, I mean, so obviously it's like the, the grape or... Yeah. It's, I mean, ferment is our typical grape it's, used yeah. in Tokai, which is totally yeah. a world apart from this. Yeah. But I, I'm not sure what they plant there. I mean, the Lerodon story is very interesting because they also, his brother manages um, a beautiful estate in Tokai as well. But um, but it, I'm anyway. I, I'm not sure what the I'm not sure what the kind of link of the name is. We'll go. Let's go ask him. <laughs> we'll grill him and see if he's got the answer. I don't think he knows that you do. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, we'll all stop pointing fingers now. <laughs> None of us know. <laughs> we'd, have, we'd have to dive into, into wine grapes and see if there's an anecdote about it. Okay, we're going to move over to Itata. Um, Itata for me is just one of the most exciting wine regions of the New World because I think this is, this is really where we're getting those that kind of lost world of, of amazing grape varieties and old wines, and there's so much diversity in Tata, and it's only really now starting to be kind of discovered and untapped. And part of the reason why we have these incredible old wines down here in the south um, is because it got largely ignored by the rest of Chile. So while further, further north it was modernizing, and very much with this kind of border influence, and bringing in these very popular international varieties of Merlot, Cabernet <coughs> Sauvignon. Um, Itata you know, was seen as a very humble, slightly kind of poor um, wine region towards the south. And so Maori as well to some extent, but very much Itata, Bio Bio, kind of got left to their own. And uh, most of these grapes, as you can see, we've got over 10,000 hectares remaining, with over 5,000 growers officially. Vineyards officially. Unofficial estimates for Tata are around 10,000, <coughs> which gives you an idea of the scale of these vineyards being really quite tiny. Um, and some, when you do visit the families down there, and they're all family owned, and when you do visit the families down there, they talk of their vineyards in terms of numbers of plants rather than hectares or acres. So that gives you a real idea of how personal these are. Many of them have been handed down you know, three, four, five generations um, and looking after these vines in a very personal uh, and human manner. And that's what I think is so special about the data. Not only do we have these old vines, but we have these beautiful stories and very um, unique expressions of wines. We really split the data into kind of two um, coastal hillsides. So in Chile, we have two mountain ranges running across the country the Andes and the coastal mountain ranges. And, the, and it's here where we get these lovely granite soils and it gives you quite kind of lively wines because we're also closer to the coast. So that cooling influence uh, from the Pacific. And then inland Itata is our other main <coughs> separation of Itata. And this is all river valleys. So here we get those more river soils, those gravels and clay, um, and a lot more kind of depth and richness to the wines. So if you were to do a nice kind of país comparison, here you'd be looking at much lighter, fresher, maybe herbal. Here you'd be looking at kind of deeper color, richer, more body. Um, so a lot of variation in the tatter as well. And also I think the older the vine, in my opinion, um, 
the more it really expresses its particular place <coughs> rather than the variety. So you get some very nice kind of terroir expressions in a tata. Um, what we're going to be tasting, our second one, uh, is a sinso, which I think is also one of the most exciting varieties in the region. Um, and here we get beautiful old lines of sinso, which start to kind of take on some of the depth and, and, and real kind of interest that this variety can show. This is the project of Marco Puyo, who is head winemaker of Vinic San Pedro, which is one of the biggest in Chile for many years. Uh, and then he decided to be, a few years ago, and make his own booty project, very much picking the terroirs that he was really excited about. Um, called Chagua is one of his kind of key areas that he's really been championing, but he's also got this lovely sense of from Coilemo, which is near Guadaliwe, in the coastal kind of granite hill sites. So that slightly kind of lighter, fragrant style. The vines here are about 40 plus years old, and we're about 20 kilometers from the coast. And this is very much about making the wine with low intervention, show that real kind of freshness of the fruit, express that kind of simplicity of, of this, this variety, but also the kind of nuances that you get from the terroir. So all kind of in um, concrete grass, no influence of oak whatsoever. I think this is lovely. For me this is, you know, that my kind of wine that I like, slightly chilled, perfect kind of summer going into autumn, perfect for this kind of like bleh, weather in the middle where you don't want something too kind of hearty yet, but you, you want a bit more kind of bones and structure. What does everyone think of this, this wine and kind of a tartar sensor in general? But does anyone stock it yet? I know it's kind of new to the profile, the portfolio. It's pretty well. <laughs> We've only got about 900 hectares of sensor left uh, in Chile. But Almost all of it is old wine, so I think you know, the quality that we're getting from Chile, and so especially from the south, is really up there with some of the exciting kind of sensos happening elsewhere. <coughs> okay, we're going to jump over to uh, Argentina now, cross over to the Andes, and anyone, in case, unless anyone has any kind of questions about this region of Chile. One question. So the, the Itatina part of the label, that seems quite clever given the region it's from. Is that the way that they're all going to be labelled from that region now? Or, yeah. or is that, that's, or that's, is that, or is that that's just his smart marketing? His smart yeah, marketing. Absolutely. But a lot of people are really, a lot of winemakers are really trying to champion Itata on the label. Because that's really where my question is. Yeah, so how are they going to chunk in the region? There are, so there are interesting movements of using communal names. Vignon is one, Carignan will come to that later. Um, there's Al Maule, which is one for um, Pais Maybe Maule. There's a few kind of regional names that, that people are trying to use together. Um, but, you know, a lot of the winemakers are really trying to put the wine region of Tata on their label and now um, because we need to revalue these regions in order to kind of get, um, you know, an opportunity for those old lines of families to survive, <laughs> got to basically. Get, got to get the market to come with you. Yeah. Absolutely. And the thing is, some of these, you know, when I used to drive around Tata over 10 years ago, um, when I first moved to South America, you could see the grapes being sold on the side of the road for 10, 20 cents a kilo, nothing. Um, and there still, there still are many of them sold for absolute pennies. Um, but things like Sinso, Carignan, um, and some Pais is starting to gain some traction and some value in the market because of winemakers you know, focusing on the area and promoting it internationally. And they're starting to sell for maybe a dollar a kilo, which is a big, you know, jump up for the grower in terms of their actual income, and um, so really important. Um, I do think there is a huge social link, especially in Chile, between the wine that you buy and how it's impacting the families. And if you're buying anything from a tata in Germany, you're not supporting lots of families in doing that. 
Uh, and I do think that's important to many consumers nowadays, is we want to know how that wine is actually impacting the people making it and the areas that it's coming from. And so I would say that Intapta and Maule is very much for the winemakers today, a cultural and social connect, not only to make wines from these beautiful old wines, but to help kind of give back to the families that have been looking after them for so long and who are under the threat of disappearance if we don't give value to them. But ultimately, I think more is delicious, so like, that's also the, the kind of main criteria as well. Okay, super. So we're going over to La Consulta, so another region of the Yucca Valley. So whereas we were in Tunian, which was quite directly above, we're now in the southernmost region of the Yucca Valley. Uh, and this is a really interesting area because a lot of people think that the Yucca Valley is new. Um, it's not. It was planted, there are, there are vines in La Consulta that are hundreds of years old. Um, and you can actually get some beautiful old white Malbec. The, the wine that we're going to be tasting is Karimusi, who has some lovely old wine now, which I think is on uh, out for tasting later. But this was a tough region to grow uh, because it is very cool. And so actually, they call it locally the cemetery um, because it's so cold. Um, and actually, he calls, I think he says that they also called it candidly the Turkish cemetery because they said that many of the warm blooded Turks went to die there and couldn't survive. But that's not true. <laughs> People didn't necessarily die there, but it is prone to frost and it is a very kind of cool climate. Uh, and that's why we also get a really important plantation at Tempranillo. This is like the most important area in Argentina for Tempranillo um, and being an early ripening Temprano grape variety. Uh, so, a really interesting area to explore um, and some lovely kind of old vines, as well as a lot of people pioneering. Uh, new plantations in the area. But Karim Musi's kind of um, goal with Alta Cedro when he uh, developed it was very much to, to look at the potential of Tempranillo and focus entirely on this area of Aconsulta, which I think he really helped put on that. Uh, and today we've got lots of winemakers moving into the area because there's such great potential there. Uh, and obviously, the cooler the climate today, the better in terms of climate change. Um, so please go ahead and taste this one. So these are all old wines of Tempranillo, and as traditionally planted in the area, they are all on Peral. Um, so Peral being similar to like, Italian Pergola, um, which is actually very good. A very, it's funny because I think a lot of people don't see it as the highest quality production method because, you know, when the Bordelais is kind of swept in and removed to BSP, um, but actually a lot of winemakers are moving back to Burrell because in the sunny kind of warm regions of Mendoza, your Pergola Burrell actually gives you some really good shade um, and the sunshine is higher, so the reason they were planted here was it's higher from the ground, so not susceptible to frost uh, lower down. Uh, and there's some interesting new plantings happening in, in Peral and Perla now as well. So, a historic method, but one that we're kind of revisiting uh, looking back on. And as is kind of classic with Spanish Tempranillo, we see a bit of American oak coming in here, which gives us that nice kind of slight bit of sweetness which I think suits this variety very well. But what I love about this Tempranillo in particular is that it's got a real kind of graphite mm -hmm. freshness to it on the finish, in my opinion. Um, how do you all find it? Have you tried much Tempranillo or much mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have 5,500 hectares of Tempranillo, so quite a fair amount. Um, but I would definitely say that Caribbean Russi is, is Absolutely the one who's kind of made it and waving the flag for it um, at a premium level and um, showing it to the world. I think he does it very successfully with, with this one. Okay, any comments, questions, thoughts before we tick along? All right, so. Everyone's had uh, <laughs> a 
copper whites now to, to, get the, to get into the mood. What do you think is the most planted grape variety in South America? I'm supposed to get it right. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping that people were guessing. But, well, you said it, haven't they? I'm saying it's not it. I've got some answers at least out there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so absolutely, Cabernet Sauvignon is. Um, so I should never ask anyone in the front row first. <laughs> um, so Cabernet Sauvignon is the very, the most planted grape variety. Which I will still find quite surprising, actually, because I think that, you know, perhaps we often think of Malbec as one of the key varieties, but Chile really is king for Cabernet Sauvignon, but it is also very important in Argentina. Chile is, in fact, outside of Bordeaux, outside of France, the biggest producer of Cabernet Sauvignon in the world. Um, so, really significant. Um, Malbec is in there as one of our kind of top varieties, and obviously Argentina leading the way. Merlot uh, is important in both countries. Common year, minimal in Argentina, although obviously um, very interesting production in Chile. And then we've got our two kind of unusual suspects who are growing in recognition, Cabernet Franc and Petit Verdot. And there's a lot of interesting kind of stories about these varieties because all of them came in originally in the 1850s with that kind of uh, big, you know, new influence from, from Europe at the time. Carmenere was obviously mistaken from the low for many years. Malbec, they didn't really know what it was for many years, they just called it the French rape. Uh, so there's been this great rediscovery of these varieties. The Cabernet Franc uh, and Petit Verdot have been kind of quiet and uh, quiet little heroes in the background used for blends, um, and I think they're really starting to kind of grow in importance as single varieties. Uh, so the wine that we're going to be tasting is a single variety of Petit Verdot. 100%. Um, Petit Verdot, as you may well know, is a pretty tough grape variety in, in Bordeaux, and I don't know that anyone's making it as a single variety, but it is growing actually in Bordeaux because this is a variety that is actually very well um, suited to climate change and warmer temperatures. So actually in saint Emilion we're seeing some kind of in new interest in Petit Bordeaux because it gives you that acidity and it retains acidity um, and if you have warmer years you can ripen it. Whereas in Argentina we can ripen it every year and we can ripen it to a really kind of beautiful level uh, where it isn't too feisty. It's actually, I think, quite a smooth line. What do you think of this? Have you tried to make a single variety of it? It's quite rare to find. I think it really is, you know, really, there's, a, there's a little bit happening in the US and a uh, tiny bit in South Africa too, but I think it is quite hard to find a single variety of Petit Verdot. And I think, sorry, for me it gives you like a really, you know, it's got a real richness, it's a very full-bodied wine. It's quite flowery. It's quite flowery. It's quite flowery. It's quite I also find something, for me, like something kind of, Black olive meatiness to it, like some mm. real depth. Like it's definitely a food wine. It's yes. 100 percent something you want to have. It reminds me of like the red version of the Verts trying Uh-huh, interesting. Yes, like the red version of that. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. I also think we've got some nice kind of like uh, Petit Verdot coming through on this wine. Mm. Um, this is definitely a wine that they you know are making for special occasions and something to perhaps to can. Um, so I do think we get some of that nice kind of perfume mm -hmm. spice. That's got that perfume flower. Yeah. I'll say that the alcohol is a lot better integrated in some of like this than other varietal petty that I've had from South Africa. Mm -hmm. just, um, there's no other definition of hot wine, but it's probably South African petty that though it's very, yeah. very, very brash and muscly, whereas this one's a lot sweeter. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've had to really push the right hand side, which is why we're seeing high alcohol, but yeah, I agree, it's integrated. Yeah. Yeah. 
And I think that's to do with our altitude, you know, the benefit of altitude where you can get full ripeness, um, but good acidity, which just keeps that alcohol nicely in check. So, I mean, it is 15%, but I do think it is balanced. It's definitely, you know, it's not, you're not going to drink two bottles yourself, or you, you might regret it in a minute, but, but it is, you know, it is in balance, it is in check. Um, and I think, you know, in Argentina, at altitude, we really can kind of have it all, which is, you know, a great asset to have. You can have full alcohol, full fruit, full ripeness, and freshness, and colour. Um, and I think the kind of challenge is, is making sure that you get that balance, I think this achieves it nicely. Um, any other kind of thoughts about this one before we move on? This is very much, you know, the Velasco family. I'm sure you're all very aware, working with Condor, about the story of the Velasco family. But I think this line in particular kind of shows, you know, their favourite selection of varieties and regions, um, and highlighting some of those key terroirs for, for kind of top, um, you know, premium reds and also whites. Um, All right, we'll move on to Perignan, um, which is an interesting story in Chile as well. So one of these varieties that, this one came in in the early 1900s, and forgive me for those that I'll be repeating um, this from our last session. The Carignan is a, has an interesting story which really involves around this 1939 earthquake. Uh, in which Chile being an incredibly seismic country, one of the most uh, seismically active countries in the world, had an enormous earthquake uh, which killed many people, and the epicenter was in Xi'an, which is in Itata, um, just below Maui, uh, and, and so many wine families were affected uh, by this, and wineries completely flattened too. But actually one of the grand plans at the time was to give people Carignan, which, if you've tasted Paris, is a great kind of, um, you know, antidote to the light and, and lightly coloured and, and softer wise of Paris, to give it a bit of carignan to kind of bolster up the blend. Um, that didn't go to plan because of the problem that we have with mildew. Carignan is very susceptible to mildew, so actually many of the plantings at the time got abandoned. But the ones that have survived, just shy of a thousand hectares, are incredibly old vines, and we really start to see some beautiful quality of carignan coming through, some great concentration. Uh, and in this case, uh, we have a pure carignan um, from old goblet vines, much like in, in the <coughs> uh, in Malden. And this is where we do see um, some winemakers getting together and using this elective term uh, for carignan to, to promote the region. Uh, in this case, um, we're looking at a single bottling uh, for, uh, for the Toro de Piedra and, and Rekiwa white brand. Uh, and this is their top pairing now. And I think this, is, this shows the real kind of brightness uh, and full fruit uh, that you get from Chilean pairing now, which I do think is very different to any of the kind of pairing we get from Spain or France. And I've tasted some really old vintages of pairing now. And I do think this is a wine that ages wonderfully well, um, and one that you can kind of hold on to for over decades. Uh, it's still so kind of vivacious, full of acid, um, full of fresh fruit. I always get really nice kind of raspberry notes to this, like just so, even though it's a wine with a lot of personality and texture in the palate, I also think it's quite a kind of flirty wine, I think it's quite kind of attractive in the nose, it captures you, um, with this kind of floral and um, fresh raspberry notes. What do you all think? Have you, have you tried this before? Yes, I've tried it before. I think, I think it's when you show in tastings, uh, the public, uh, obviously a little bit better than the reluctance initially, Looking for labels on bottles, but when you show it to them and they taste it, it's, it's one of those moments, and they just said that's one of the best wines on the table. So, just, it's just got, it has a little bit of wow factor. Yeah, definitely. It's a certainty for the public. 
I think so. I think it's one of those. And I think chili can do that wow factor really well because you just, in chili, you get this real brightness of fruit. And it's so, you know, it's because of the amazing sunshine that you have there and the kind of purity of the air. And you just get this incredible brightness of fruit. It's so easy to, to blind taste to lay your mind because it, it smells like fresh black fruit and red fruit from the forest. And I think it delivers, you know, I think this is so much wine for the money because, it, again, it's really balanced with that great, it is a big wine in terms of, you know, it's very active in your mouth. But it's got that great acidity, it's got that great fruit purity, and then some of that spice and kind of sweet nuance running through. This is, for me, Caragana in Chile is one of the ones that have, has everyone tried Morcilla blood sausage? No. Like, in South American blood sausage is much nicer than the stuff we get here because they put so many spices through it, and it's a lovely, kind of rich, like, earthy taste, um, which balances beautifully with something like Similar to, like, the more cheap. Yeah. Like yeah. But it's not spicy. Yeah, bringing in some like bringing in some of those really kind of more exotic spices in there. Not not spicy and hot, but spiced in. Yeah. Has anyone got a favourite does anyone have this and sell this and have a nice pair? Yeah. Try the little sausage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or something rich, like some of the nice kind of stews and that dark kind of meats. We we started. 100% carrying from another one in the Parma yeah. um, in Italian. It's, it's got similar notes, um, and it, but it has more of that kind of like cured or savoury meat mm. to it that you sometimes get with carrying. Because this one is, like I said, all about fruit, mm. and then it's got that spot like that, that lovely kind of spicy finish. Yeah. Um, both are great. Both are great. Yeah. This is the first one I'm actually drinking. But it's interesting because I feel like actually the Petit Verdot is full of body, it's more rich. But I think the reason that you know the Carignan we should have last in this tasting is because that acidity is so hard. You know, it really is it's a wine that would cut through so many dishes. Um, and yeah, I, I think you know it does have wow factor. But for me all of these wines have their own wow factor in a different way. Um, you know, from the lighter juices and so to our kind of bolder reds and then very textural um, jackpot. Um, well, I've raced through that quite quickly, but, <laughs> but you do, but you've got lots of wines to, to taste outside, um, and I know you're going to, to, to carry on tasting. So, if anyone does have any more questions about the wine regions in general or comments about the wines, then I'm here for now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.